Hi, I'm Rob Malteri. I'm the creator and writer of Snowpaw and the hit series Nightwolf. You can find me at uh, Lone Wolf Comics on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, uh, LoneWolfComics.com, or at Rob Malteri, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined by uh, a talented comic creator called Snowpaw, but he is the owner and creator of Lone Wolf Comics. We're joined today by Rob Maltari. How are you doing today, Rob? Good, how are you? For those that don't know anything about Lone Wolf Comics or, or about yourself, tell us a little bit about... Um, well, both. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Lone Wolf Comics is my um, it's self-publishing company that I started uh, a few years ago uh, in, when I was putting out my book Night Wolf. And uh, so Night Wolf is basically a story about a young man who finds out that he's born a werewolf and gets thrown into a supernatural war. That's kind of like where everything all stemmed from. I have several different titles that I want to put out and produce uh, within a shared universe, which I you know, called my Lone Wolf Comics universe. It's kind of similar to like Marvel and DC where they're, you know, it's all these heroes or titles, you know, they actually live and exist in the same um, space and will interact and cross over over time. That's kind of like where like it all began as far as like, you know, my publishing company. Uh, so this is like still is a part-time thing for me. I'm trying to make it into a full-time things have been progressing well so you know it's, it's like the, it's been going like a snowball effect and i've been trying to keep up with it <laughs> so looking at the website i i love the fact that you're you're fleshing out your world you have hints of new stories and new um, aspects coming down the pipe like you just mentioned here as well too you know what spurred your passion for comics and how did you come upon your current comic with snowpaw so uh what got me into comics in the first place is um i'm uh, dyslexic and um, have adhd and i struggled to learn to read whenever i was a kid so one thing that my mom tried to do to help me you know because she knew that i liked watching cartoons and superheroes and stuff like that um, so she bought me some comic books, uh, and I had, and, you know, I'd like looking through the pictures and all that and kind of getting that context of like what the story is that way. And then she bought me, I remember there was, when I was younger, a Batman set of three, it was like the untold tales of Batman or legends or something along the lines like that. And, uh, they came with a cassette tape and so, and the cassette tape had actors, who would act, you know, verbally act out the um, the word bubbles and, and the narrations and everything from those books. So I was able to follow along, kind of start putting words together, uh, figuring out what they were and what they meant. And from there, it just grew, you know, a passion for comics and a love of reading them. Part of the deal was if my grades improved, if I behaved, I would get three comic books a week. So for me, I was like, there was very few times that I acted out and did bad. So I could, you know, because when I didn't get my comics that week, I was, I was sour. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, oh. So again, that grew that li lifetime love of comics. So I became a very avid collector, even, you know, when, you know, the transition from like, okay, now I'm no longer getting these comics from my parents. I'm saving up my own money and I'm buying, you know, um, doing chores or whatever and, anything I could to, um, you know, be able to afford them myself. Fast forward farther um, to, for your second part of that question is how I got into Snowpaw. Um, so Snowpaw is a sort of a spinoff prequel, if you will, to Nightwolf. Uh, Nightwolf, again, being the, the young man who finds out that he's born a werewolf, um, she is in present time his mentor. So starting from issue three, when she made her first appearance, to right now we're almost, we're working on issue six of Nightwolf and um, she's basically training him and helping him to, to learn how to battle against, um, you know, evil forces and um, become, you know, how to control his werewolf, you know, strength and powers and, and, and ferocity because she's such a dynamic character and she sometimes overshadows him as a main character. A lot of people really enjoyed her and she's actually even my favorite character in the book. And so I may have in, unintentionally made her stronger <laughs> in that regard. <laughs> 
I pulled my my wolf pack, which is my my audience of readers, which I um, you know lo- love to refer to them as because I I feel like we're a pack together. I like to talk to my audience, and you know we reply on, if, on socials and, and emails and stuff. So I mean I'm I'm very open to talking to everybody who's um, who wants to interact with me. You know I pulled my wolf pack and I said, hey, what series, what title would you like to see next? And I have my other three titles: um, Crimson Dawn, Arcane, and Redemption. I said, or would you like to see a, a series about Snowpaw's origins? It wasn't even a contest; <laughs> like the voting was like completely one sided. <laughs> so I was like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> I guess subconsciously you've been preparing for this series then, you know, since the beginning. So that that's great to see. Yeah. And loaded loaded question polls are always always the best. There. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you try to hide it where you put it like down the list or whatever, yeah. but in reality you just wanted it first either way. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. It's, it's I slipped it in there thinking I'm like, this could be a really good possibility. <laughs> and then I was like, Well, there you are. I, I mean I didn't even <laughs> didn't even have well, to nudge it in that direction. <laughs> Well, then looking at the the creation of this character, what did you draw from to create this uh, definitely strong-willed and and powerful creator? Especially when I'm reading Snowpaw, you know, you show vulnerability, but you also show, you know, that there's a hidden layer underneath, you know, the the character. Mm -hmm. I am a big fan of Chris Claremont. Uh, Mm -hmm. He wrote a lot of X-Men, New Mutants, and Excalibur. Um, back in the you know 80s through 90s and into today, he's even done some um, more recent ones that I found out about. He had developed a lot of um, the way I write my accents, for actually Irish and Scottish, because you know he would write banshees, um, you know brogue and for the Irish and similar. It, it was you could tell there was a slight difference in variation in how he did the Irish yeah. versus Scottish. Um, you know, when, with between the interaction between him and Moira Mataggart, who's you know. Scottish and also um, Wolfsbane, um, who is a Scottish character as well. And I, you know, growing up, I always loved like the werewolf characters and gravitated towards them. So like she was one of my favorite X characters growing up as well and reading comics. And I always wanted her to develop into a more stronger character. I always felt that she was kind of more of a sidekick or a side story. Even, you know, like it was a team thing, but she was always kind of like put to the side. Um, so I always, she was very meek and, and, or like there was the other part where she was then very ferocious, but wasn't like, it, you know, it wasn't like strong and, and, and in her own, you know what I mean? It was, it was more like of a tortured, abused, like freak out. And I always wanted to see her develop into a bigger character and then use her a little more properly, which never happened. You know, I, I did X-Men fan fiction when I was 13 and I had sent it to, um, you know, Marvel with her a little bit more in the, the limelight. Um, it also involved like a story of Wolverine getting his adamantium back because at the time I was still pissed that he didn't have it <laughs> after they, after Magneto ripped it out. And then I created a whole new team of, it was another like X-Men new mutants uh, generation X spinoff kind of a thing with new characters that I developed because I wanted to come up with new characters. I, you know, I wanted to introduce my own characters into like the Marvel world. Right. When I got a very nice rejection letter from Marvel saying that, you know, we can't use your stuff because our plans are already so far in advanced, but you know, thank you. And we can encourage you to keep up the, you know, the work and all that. So that kind of burned, you know, it made the flame go higher for me to, to, to do this. So I took my character's, and I kind of sprinkled them into different stories, but where one of the characters um, who interacted with Wolfsbane kind of morphed into who Nightwolf is now, I kind of still had that, like I wanted that, I wanted to be able to write a, uh, a strong Scottish female character werewolf. Um, and I wanted to have like something similar, but I also wanted her to make Snowpaw everything that I wanted to see in uh, Wolfsbane that I didn't get to. Um, as well as, you know, to, to make her like, basically like in my mind, like the, the, the perfect strong heroine who, you know, wasn't just, um, you know, the, the sidekick or whatever, you know, from the brief portion that I got to read. And and I definitely want to read more. I I love the fact that, you know, the, the characters are interesting. You know, I don't know some of these characters. I've never interacted with any of the night wolf series, which I'm going to fix as well too because now i'm interested in in the series um and it's not just because snow wolf is such a bad past quite literally uh but as a writer what theme spoke to you when you were creating not only night wolf but the snowpaw series it, with night wolf it was more of like i 
as I, I writing his teenage self and his interactions in the first few issues, um, was a lot of like experienced things in that, that I could take from. And, and, you know, a lot of my writing has a lot of like real life experience injected into like the supernatural side of things and then kind of take it where, um, you know, all that is, is kind of like a Batman moment, you know, like something terrible, tragic happens and that his entire like normal life gets ripped away. You know, tragedy begets interest and, um, you know, it makes it for more of a better story. Right. And so you have to have that conflict, the tragedy, the heartache and to show how they overcome from that. And that's kind of like where Nightwolf kind of like moves after issue three in that direction, showing like a lot of like, you know, uh, heartache, t- you know, pain, suffering, like throughout, you know, years of experience. Right. And now with like Snowpaw going back to it, there's a lot, there's a lot of interaction with her and her father, which now like I'm a father, I have a four year old and, you know, like already, like I can see like when she's going to be a teenager, I can see where this is going because she's a very (laughs) strong willed uh, little bug. And uh, I can kind of see, you know, that where that's going. And and then, you know, and I've also, I have two older sisters. Right. So I know I've Mm -hmm. seen where like, the interactions between like my family dynamic and how that all kind of played into things. And you could kind of see how, you know, the family dynamic works in the first issue. So like, that's kind of like where that all stemmed from. I wanted to take like, you know, werewolves are obviously a known thing. Um, I wanted to make them different because one, I always thought I was like, well, why can't we see a werewolf that has, it's keeps its mental faculties Um, that can change at will and they're born that way. You know, they weren't cursed and they're not just ferocious beasts. They actually have thoughts, you know, plans and schemes and, and, you know, love and heartache and all that stuff. I wanted um, to create characters like, so like I developed a whole mythology around that because I wanted to, you know, people always like say, oh, we're going to show the different types of vampires and this and that. And I'm like, well, why doesn't anybody do this for werewolves? Well, it's it's the fantastical aspect. I mean, the fact that you have free reign to do whatever you want because it's your own series, plain and simple. So, yes, you're taking the basic mythos of um, of werewolves and, and of that type of fantastical nature for these types of cryptids. What did you draw from to create the the world then? Because obviously you're not basing it off of present day earth, uh, <laughs> so to speak, but this world seems very fantastical, especially since you're trying to also tie in three or four other series as well that haven't quite materialized. Like Snowpaw, uh, because it's, it's takes place 200 years prior to the events of Nightwolf. Um, in chronological order, obviously that comes first. Um, it's a, you know, the past has like a brighter, like kind of a more fantasy feel to it because I, the way I kind of like have it in my mind set up as time progresses, like these fantasy creatures or supernatural creatures, they are, they're you know, more prevalent, but people don't see them. They're kind of like, they, they ignore or don't, they're oblivious to their existence until like your eyes are open to them. Uh, but like, I like to show like with there's hidden characters within the book, um, like brownies and fairies and other such creatures, they're kind of like Easter eggs, but to show that they, they exist in this world, you know, and as time goes on, there's a reason why they kind of become less prevalent and you don't see them in the modern day. Um, like with Nightwolf, it's, you know, it's a lot more hidden, a lot more, you know, it's, it's not in your face as in your face, um, because, you know, like the humans have become more aware and like try to, uh, there, there's a scene where like the FBI is in like area 51 in uh, night wolf issue four, where you can see them. And like in these glass tubes, they have like different kind of creatures, like fairies, mermaids, and, and me- some men, uh, mentors caught in um, like these, these tubes where the, like, the FBI you know, director is on the phone. Like he's looking at the tubes, like they're trying to weaponize these or learn what they are, you know, you know, having them more free and apparent versus like more of a closed, darker, horrific kind of a modern or even p- slightly postmodern in Nightwolf where, um, you know, a lot of this stuff happens and, you know, the times change and evolve as the time is gone. So I try to keep them separate between the two series because it's a different time frame. Um, whereas like Nightwolf is present moving into the future, if you will, where and Snowpaw kind of explains like where the present is now from like the past moving to that 200 years to kind of meet in, in the middle, if you will. Obviously planning out this type of book must have taken a while to you're working with an amazing team and we'll definitely add, i'll touch upon 
your team itself because the art is beautiful the writing is, is solid you've done an amazing job with that and, and as i mentioned kind of previously before we started here the action sequences were just so fluid and so amazing like i loved everything about that series so that's why i want to see nightwolf because i'm sure you're continuing that train of of fluid action oh yeah um it felt it almost felt like i was looking at a movie so to speak so i could see this as maybe you know like a live action t thing eventually down the path. writing the series like so the way i i visualize everything like a movie or a tv show like when i'm sitting let's say i'm just doing whatever and it doesn't take much thought right so i'm i'm daydreaming thinking about it how it's playing out in my head and then i write it like i do kind of each panel is very set up like a script um storyboard just because you know you have the different camera angles the different shots um to try and keep it interesting and then when i hand it off to the artist which for snowpaw is mog park um who's an amazing illustrator um she's worked with game of thrones and she's done a lot of comic covers um and i'm very thankful that she accepted um, you know, this job as a sequential artist, as well as Bruna Costa, who is my colorist, who's brought the vibrant colors to this world. Um, so it's very amazing. And, um, but with Mog, um, she took the script and was able to, you know, like her and I work very closely together and um, about how to set up the shots. We do it step by step. So she would set up the layout with a rough, you know, whether the layout worked or not, we kind of tweaked her and, or sometimes she was spot on. And then same with the layout, like, the, you know, made sure she fleshed out the action. Um, you know, if everything was good, we'd move on to the detail and, you know, and then pass it on to Bruno. And I'm very open to, like, suggestions. Like, if my script doesn't cover something that she thinks she can make look better, um, like, if she need, takes two panels combined to one or one panel divided, you know, however it works, I'm, I'm very open unless there's a pacing situation where I'm like, no, that has to be paced just like this for either suspense or page turns or, you know, stuff like that. Or there's times where I missed a page turn and she's like, oh, I can make this a page turn. It's very rare, you know, that I have to be like, no, but, you know, it, it happens occasionally. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Mog and Bruna both did an amazing job uh, with the art and um, Dave Lentz's uh, lettering was was spot on. Like I, I do the lettering for Nightwolf, it, but it was such a relief to hand that off to Dave, who I knew... Uh, would do a great job with it and it just he was so fast I, like it blew my mind because like i have so much other stuff going on that, like it takes me forever to letter a book <laughs> but he's like oh here's a page here's a page <laughs> <laughs> looking at the finished copy of this particular book there's obviously a lot going on in it there and i don't know how long the book is how, how many pages is snowpaw 24 24 okay. oh, the first issue yeah so i do 24 issues and then um i like to collect uh, after four issues i like to collect them into a trade paperback um so i did that with night wolf issues one through four and uh, it came out nice and i plan on kind of keeping that same with uh, snowpaw looking at the the entire series of snowpaw so far as it is as it stands right now because we'll have you back on for for issue two and every other series you have you're you're an entertaining person what it what was the hardest scene for you to write Oh, um, so I think the action scene um, where after her first transition, I think was the hardest. I didn't want to make this book as gory as I would Nightwolf. Again, Nightwolf has a little bit more horror to it, and this is a little bit more fantasy. And I wanted this one to be like something that my daughter and girls and anybody really can, you know, pick up and, and enjoy. I didn't want it to be too, too bloody, too uh, violent, but in the same sense, it's a werewolf book. So I had to balance that. <laughs> so I felt that that was the hardest part was balancing, you know, what, my, what my natural instinct is to write something very like brutal <laughs> and tone that down. And the bright colors also kind of downplay the, that type of violence. Right, of right, yeah, yeah. It's not, yeah, exactly. The, like, it's night and day. It's like Night Wolf is so dark and grueling, and this one's, like, so bright and vibrant, and, and like, oh, it, it still looks good, you know, despite the... <laughs> Don't worry about that dead body. That's yeah. perfectly fine. It's just completely normal. And then in terms of editing this particular book, what did you edit out? So, you know what's funny is I, I didn't really edit much out because I kind of worked backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I started with the last page um, because I knew that's where I wanted to have the initial cliffhanger. Let's kind of start from the beginning and kind of work. I, so I worked in the, like from end to beginning to the middle. 
so it wasn't as much as like cutting anything out as much as like, I think what I did not include, which I would have liked to would have been a little bit more interaction um, between like the engagement party of, um, I had initially thought to show some more werewolf action there rather than um, without getting too much into spoiler territory, um, the hints that I dropped. <laughs> I did want to put a little bit more something there, um, but because of time constraints and, and I felt that um, that could be something that I could have revealed as a flashback later. Mm. Um, that So I may still put that, that in there, but again, I... Um, I think that it were, it was the right thing to cut out or not include, if you will. I was always curious about that because the editing process sometimes is some people's joy and other people's chagrin. So <laughs> it is what it is there. Um, as a writer, then I'm always curious about this too, because you're, you're the second person that I know of that has ADHD. And the other person that we had on a couple of weeks back was an artist. And so dealing with this type of creative block sometimes, what exactly is your kryptonite as a writer? Because you did mention Batman and DC and all that. So as a writer, I think time is my biggest kryptonite. Um, I, you know, I have between full-time job, family, and then doing this. And basically not only am I writing, I'm promoting, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing the business hat, I'm ordering the books, I'm, you know, I'm the graphic and web designer, for, you know, like I'm the promoter, you know what I mean? Like I, I basically do everything but the art side of the pages. And um, I think that's, to me, that's my biggest time constraint. But I also use my attention deficit, I think, as a superpower. Um, I've learned how to work best with it. Um, so when I find myself uh, getting like to, to prevent the distracted part of things. I always listen to music while I'm working and whether it's sometimes I have to crank it up really high. Like when I'm doing like graphic design, I like to have it high and then, you know, while I'm moving stuff around, cause I think it kind of helps me get motivated. Um, but then when I'm writing, I like to turn it down and just have it to kind of be that background noise to block out like random house noises or kids screaming or, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Um, it's, but like when I get my focus kind of shifts from what I'm doing to something else. So like I have, you can see like there's one monitor right here, but like the cam, you know, my camera's here because this is a different computer. This over here, like I'm on an L shaped desk and I have a, um, I have a, a windows uh, PC over here with three monitors. And then I have a Macintosh um, being a web designer. I, I test things on both platforms, but like, so this is how I work. Like I'm like, looking at all three you know like that so like because of my distraction like sometimes like my focus will move i'm working on multiple things at the same time <laughs> i'm the best multitasker in the world that's my mutant power <laughs> i have to ask this isn't even one of my questions i normally ask but what would be your superhero name then the uh, the, the tasker i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I can't say taskmaster, right? Because that's already. <laughs> yeah. I'm the multitasker, like taskmaster. No, no, no. no, no. I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, time time is flying here. Kickstarter is a second job, literally, mm -hmm. uh, on top of being a parent, on top of being a creative person that you are as well, too. Um, how is the campaign going so far, and and how are you managing? the stress that can come along with a Kickstarter. The stress it's kind of like developed over time. Like I think as you kind of get used to it, you still don't get used to everything, but the time management part of it, you're like, okay, well, this is what, what I did right versus what I did wrong. Um, I'm going to take that to my next Kickstarter and so on and so forth. So this is, I think my fifth or sixth. I also have learned to ask for help. I was doing all of the promotion before, and then I kind of had help um, through a couple others, um, you know, for posting stuff and helping me out with that while I'm doing other promotional stuff. So, I mean, not that the, my promotion stuff has stopped necessarily. I, I've used uh, a couple friends to, to help post things out as well. And um, so that's helped a lot. And then this campaign, especially Mog, has been very active in promoting, which is amazing because um, my Nightwolf artist, Carlos, is from Chile and he doesn't speak a lot of English. Um, we work online chatting stuff, which he has the translators. 
Um, so sometimes there's a little bit of a language gap that he and I kind of have to work through. Mog, B- Mog Park, uh, being able to uh, help and promote, and um, you know that's that's been a, a great great help with this time around, and I, it shows that it's helped because I mean, right now we're already way past. Um, my highest backed campaign was my previous one for issue five of Nightwolf at 514 backers. Right now we're sitting at 558 backers for this campaign that still has five, uh, four days to go. And um, I mean, we're, we're sitting at $17,239. I, you know, we've sold several pieces of original art. Um, and we still have several left if anybody's out there who wants to get it. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so I mean, it's, it's going very well. And, you know, Mog and I are both very pleased um, and that, that people like the book and that we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of returning Nightwolf readers as well as a lot of new people coming on, um, you know, joining the Wolf Pack. And, uh, you know, I'm very happy with, you know, the turnout and, and how things have been progressing through the campaign. You know, as a writer, when was the first time that you learned that language had power? Oh, very early on. I mean, even not even so much as a writer. Um, I was the fat kid that got picked on reading comics, you know. Um, so that's how I grew up. So words had power because the bullies, you know, constantly. Like, I mean, I would come home crying from school. Um, I would get into fights. I mean, you know, like I, I wouldn't throw a punch until they said something about my mom. And then that's when, you know, gloves were off and... Um, oftentimes they regretted it, afterwards. <laughs> but I was the one in detention <laughs> or suspension, <laughs> you know, verbal words definitely have power. It, like when you, when you're invested in a story, you feel for a character, you, you know, like, I mean, like, I was upset when I get that, that, ser- that, you know, going back to the Wolverine losing his adamantium from, from Magneto. Like I felt that. Like I was like, you know, no, you know? So, I mean, that's kind of like, you know, getting into, like, I always felt that like, I wanted to do something epic and write something epic, create a story that people can feel. And, you know, so that was kind of like, you know, early on before I even like sat down and wrote something, I, you know, I would care draw my terrible character designs. Um, <laughs> it was funny, a friend of mine in school, he was really good at drawing and I was semi good. I wasn't really, you know, I always thought that I wasn't good, but I like had the imagination to, to do the suits and lay them out even as flat and, and, you know, what, you know, as they were. And, um, but he was like, man, he's like, I wish I could come up with ideas like that. I'm like, but you're a great artist. He's like, yeah, but I'm just repeating what I'm seeing, <laughs> you know? So, um, it, it's funny too, like to have that, you know, where, where somebody, you know, you're like, oh, well, I have all this imagination. And I want to be able to put it down on paper, but my hand doesn't work like his does. You know what I mean? <laughs> what was the first thing that you wrote that made you realize that I could do this as a career? I wrote out issue one through one through 12 for Nightwolf. Um, and they evolved with me as I got older. And I knew that I wanted to tell this story, and, but I didn't know how it would be you know, taken. Um, I was, I was, I believed in it. I still do. After I did a failed Kickstarter in 2016 for issues one through three of Nightwolf. I only had five pages and character designs and a cover. And I went for a $20,000 goal because I was very naive to like how it worked. Right. (laughs) But I did manage rates $5,000. So had I done that for issue one, I would have been just fine. You know, just did issue one, $5,000, boom, I would have made the goal and been a hell hell of a lot farther along than I am now. But that didn't stop me um, knowing that there was at least enough interest that raised that much money to to do this. Uh, Did freelance work to, you know, web and graphic design to pay for the rest of the art to get the first issue finished. I had it printed and I'm like, okay, now what? (laughs) <laughs> um, so I went to my first comic con in 2017. I took a hundred copies with me and a bunch of character designs to fill my table. So I just didn't have a stack of books, <laughs> you know, by the end of that weekend, I had almost sold out of all hundred copies that I had with me. I called my wife and I'm like, I think we needed to start working on issue two. Like, you know, she's like, okay, yeah, that's great. Let's, you know, let's dip into our savings, you know? So that's kind of like how that, you know, we got issue two out printed it, kept going to different comic cons. Like I was traveling like six to eight, 10 hour, you know, radius around where I live. So that's how I knew I had something, you know, those, those two issues just were fun. You know, like I'm at these cons selling them left and right. 
Uh, and then to be able to do issue three, we obviously couldn't dip into the savings again, right? Because there was no more. <laughs> so that's when I decided to come back to Kickstarter. And then from there, it's kind of been fire ever since. <laughs> I have to ask this as well, too. I was, I was curious. How did you come up with the names of your characters? So with Nightwolf, um, I, I originally I came up with that name because he, his character, like there's, um, so Snowpaw is one of the purebreds, which is a, uh, in, basically meaning that she's um, a wholly good character. Like her, she's very uh, kind, very, like, one, you know, basically a good werewolf Um and then there's the evil ones who are the mongrels who are, you know, their, their pelts are black as their souls. And um, so you have like the white wolves and the black wolves, kind of like the yin yang. He's in the middle, right? So he is like a kind of a depiction of modern day where things aren't exactly black and white. They're more of a gray line. The way I had his pelt is like, so he's white up to like on his front side and then his back like his nut muzzle to his chest to the back is kind of like he's shadowed in night. So it came, that's kind of like how I developed the name as of him being Night Wolf. And that's how I wrote it in Snowpaw, giving him his tribal name. And that's kind of how I d d describe it, um, which I think you'll see in issue six is actually where this happened. And Snowpaw, I, because of the fact that she was a white furred character, it was almost a no brainer. Snow white i'm in uh western pennsylvania and it snows a lot here right so i always try to keep like some kind of a with my tribal names for these characters i try to keep it very wolf related or somehow like like natural tribal you know names in in a, in a manner like that you know with her it was like okay well she's got white fur and she's a wolf so she has paws right so snow paw <laughs> so that's that's like how that came about but the way i describe it in 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 the book and actually in issue five of Nightwolf, she tells about Silvermane, who is, who will be her mentor in Snowball for the series. Um, he's a Viking werewolf and he gave her the name because it reminded him of the snow of his Nordic you know, home. So that's, that's kind of like, that's, you know, I, I give reason in the book, but for me, it's like a different sort of, you know, like I am trying to make things fit with the character versus what they're doing, you know? Yeah. I was just curious about that. It, it, it's interesting to see the, the nameology and how, you know, maybe it's something from a, a personal experience that, that triggers this, but I, I like your explanations way better. <laughs> Thanks. Is there anything that I haven't touched on that you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview? Um, I mean, you know, uh, again, I think, you know, like Mog Park, if you ever get a chance to see her art, she, she does some gorgeous things. Um, uh, my entire team, um, including my editor who is, uh, Katrina Rhodes, um, she does a great job. Uh, and I just want to make sure that she got her acknowledgement as well. And, um, uh, Mog's husband, Mel has also been, uh, he's her manager. So he's been a very big help as well. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm very happy with my team and I'm very, you know, pleased that they accepted, you know, working with me and I can't thank them enough for all of their great effort. And, you know, I thank them so much for, for taking this. And I, I want to thank my Wolfpack, you know, for, for coming in and, and coming in strong and for the new members coming in, um, you know, thank, welcome and I uh, hope you enjoy. <laughs> Everyone has one or two people that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? So I think definitely my my mom was a main uh, again you know getting me into comics and and being very encouraging um, from like a, a like a, a natural standpoint um, but then like also like creatively out there um, again Chris Claremont Stanley um, you know a lot of the great like you know creators and comic artists and you know out there you, if it wasn't for them. You know, Jim Lee, his art for the X Men. I mean, again, it's all like all if that stuff, if I didn't get into that, I don't, wouldn't be where I am right now. From a professional perspective, you've created Nightwolf, you're, you've created Snowpaw, you have six successful Kickstarter campaigns. I'm sure you're going to have many more in the future as well, too. And you're looking to expand your world with three or four amazing series that, you know, I really want to have you on the show to talk about in the future as well so don't sit on those too long huh? I'm, I'm trying believe me <laughs> <laughs> so from a professional perspective you've you've become successful do you consider yourself personally successful 
I mean, I still have that, like, I feel like I'm, I got that imposter syndrome, if you will. Like, I don't, I don't see myself as like one of the key players out there in indie comics right now. I still, like, I, I have a lot of growth. I mean, I, I have been growing and I hope to keep that growth uh, growing exponentially to the point where I can make it a full-time gig. First, I got to make sure my family's taken care of. <laughs> I think things are, you know, going in, in the right direction where, where my dream is. Um, and like I said, it's been kind of snowballing as these uh, campaigns have been going. And I mean, it's, it's getting to the point where now I'm like I'm thinking about like, where am I going to store everything? I'm running out of room in my house and my wife's patience. <laughs> The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Um, again, you know, I had that 2016 failed Kickstarter. It did take me a couple months to kind of um, pick pick my head up uh, before I was like, all right, let's dig it in and go. You know, let's let's do this. Um, so I, I think for me, it's like I had to take a step back because you know the anticipation that that long um, disappointing end. Um, but, but I had to like, once I kind of like, you know, mellowed out, spent time, you know, more or so with family and just kind of did, you know, just relax a little bit more. Um, but then that creative bug, you know, kept, kept coming in, you know what I mean? Like kept pushing me. Um, so finally, like I was looking, okay, well, what were the positives? What did I learn from this? Um, so I think the way I deal with failure is, it hurts at first and then I need time to process it to just not do stuff. Um, as far as like creative, you know, just need to sit back and, and soak it in and, and, and just kind of recharge my batteries. And then once I, once I'm recharged, then I go into the analytic part of figuring out, well, okay, what went wrong? What can I do better? And just, then get back in the, the on this and get back in the saddle and, and and ride, you know. The younger generation is looking at your work and becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic creator or as an artist or as a creative person in their own right. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you and the fact that you're tailoring your comics towards their enjoyment in the future is always a wonderful thing to see. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think keeping in mind that like, you know, and I think a lot of other indie creators have forgotten this, that there's so much adult content for adults, which I get I, great. You know, I enjoy, I believe me, I enjoy a good, you know, um, horror thing. I write that myself. Um, you know, I, I, in, in, and there's obviously the very, very adult ones with the bus jewel um, heroes, which don't get me wrong. I get like a good eye candy too. <laughs> um, but uh, I think what, what um, you know, this, uh, this generation and the next generation should keep in mind is the next generation um, while moving in, writing something without them being interested in comics or interested in a series or interested in something without having something for them to fall in love with as a kid, like I did, you know, ha having that feeling, uh, you know, the, those, those, you know, that's where nostalgia comes from, right? You know, that's where, where a lot of these, you know, um, successful things come from is that little bit of feeling of nostalgia, like, oh, this reminds me of this, or, oh, this is, you know, that feeling, you know, you have to remember how to cultivate that in the younger uh, generation and get them involved and interested and give them an, an in, if you will. Um, so I, I definitely, you know, you make, you know, make your name and, and try, try new things. Like whether it's get writing for something for kids at first, or if you're writing something for adults, don't be afraid to try new things and, and expand, especially to invite the younger crowd in there because with the younger crowd comes a longer lasting relationship with your stories as well. Uh, you know, if you're just selling to people who, you know, are your age or older, then, you know, you may at one point, you know, not have enough to continue writing these stories for others enjoyment so you need to think about continuing or you know giving to the younger um and letting them follow along with you well i do hate to say it but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking you know i want to thank you so much rob for coming on the show i do greatly appreciate thank it you for having me. anytime but before i let you go you know how can we support you? Where can we find you on social media? Where can we promote your amazing work in the future? And 
please don't take you know a couple of years to come back on the show i'd love to have you on maybe in the future for whatever new series you decide to create sounds good well night wolf six launches in spring so if you wouldn't mind <laughs> i don't mind whatsoever right. I'm, I'm a... sounds good yeah so you can find me at lone wolf comics twitter facebook instagram um if you want to follow me personally at rob Malteri. Um, also, uh, I have a website, lonewolfcomics.com. I have a website or web store there. It's lonewolfcomics.com slash shop. Um, you can back this campaign. The quick URL link uh, is lonewolfcomics.com slash snowpaw. And that will redirect you to the campaign. And we are uh, going for another four days. We are done um, uh, on November 3rd at midnight. Well, who I guess it would be November 4th at midnight. But it's... 1159 on the third. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again for coming on the show, Rob. I do greatly appreciate it. Um, like you said, support his campaign, support his uh, his comics, and um, take a look at this amazing series in the future. Uh, look, I don't have these people on uh, on the show interviewing them if they're not a creative and talented person. So, you know, I think I've done this for 13 years enough to to showcase amazing talent. So. Go support him any way you can. And look at his amazing team as well, too. Truly an, an incredible team to to see their their talents. Uh, well, just see their talents. And see. if you go to the uh, Kickstarter page, I have their socials under their bios. So you can go to that page. If you want to follow Mog, you want to follow Bruna, click on those links. Um, you know, all, all my creators have their information there. So you can go and check them out. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geese Talk. You can first find this interview and thousands of others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And of course, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking. Hey all, Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.